morning. Welcome to church this morning. I'm so glad you're here. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Scott, and I am really glad you're here, either online or in person or whatever. Um, <clears throat> with weather like this, sometimes it makes it hard to get out in the morning, so I appreciate those that are, are here. A couple of announcements for you this morning. First, um, is more of way of a report than an announcement in the, in the strict sense of things. Um, I wanted to let you know that we have been doing quite a bit of work uh, in the church the last couple months here. Um, we've replaced the boiler. Um, we had a boiler problem that we ended up uh, getting taken care of. We have had Dressler come out and um, do work in just about every room of the church because did you know there's a sink in just about every room of the church? Um, and so they went through and fixed old faucets. They kept some of the drinking fountains that weren't there. Um, they just really did a nice job getting our plumbing in order and uh, some AV work that's happened as well. So I just want to say thank you for all those that, that continue to make sure those things move forward, um, continue to make sure that um, we are um, keeping our church in good working order. I'm excited to tell you that this Friday, is finally the Parsonage Open House. Now the, um, the um, it'll be at five o'clock at the Parsonage. Uh, it is potluck. Um, if you can't pot, you can just come in and get lucked. That's fine too. Um, we'll see what you get. Um, knowing my wife, there will be plenty of food, so please don't let that be a hindrance for you. But it's an opportunity to just come together, enjoy each other's company, play some board games, um, and just uh, just kind of hang out. So that'll start at five, and we'll go till whenever it goes. So I, I hope that uh, uh, if that's something you're interested in, we can see you there. And then um, you know, starting next week, we begin Holy Week. We begin that March to Easter. And it's hard to believe that we're here already, but um, we are. And so next week is Palm Sunday. Um, it's the Sunday where we celebrate, remember the triumphant entry of Jesus on the on the colt with the palm branches. And it's also a Sunday that we are going to welcome new members, and I will have a baptism, so um, it's going to be a day of celebration. And then later on during that week are the um, the holy days, and um, the, the Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter Sunday. And Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday are days that the church sets aside to really help us remember why we need Easter. So we start with this joy and the celebration with Jesus entering, and then it gets dark, and it gets real sad because the cross happens in between, right? And so that's what Good Friday helps us remember. That's what Good Friday helps us prepare for that Easter miracle that comes the Sunday after. So I hope that you're able to attend those. That'll be on March 28th and March 29th at 7 o'clock in the chapel. Um, so if that's something that um, you're interested in, uh, to me, it really helps frame and gets myself and my mind ready um, to celebrate the Easter miracle. But you have to go through the dark to get to the light. My friends, those are the announcements today. There's much happening here. I am so excited and so proud of this church. And let's come together and worship. One more. One more. We're just a little bit different on our bullet this morning and during the uh, three songs of our worship music uh, by our wonderful praise band is when I'll be collecting the prayer cards. So that's just a little bit earlier in the service than usual. Thank you. Please stand and join us in our first song.
name is Dick Derby, your liturgist this morning, and I'm smiling because it's such a treat to have our praise band with us this morning, and I'm also smiling because despite the weather and the snow, we are gathered together to worship in our church and to our Savior, Jesus Christ, and that is just one of the, one of the great things. And so as we begin that this morning, please join me as we do in our call to worship. Though the storm clouds of doubt and fear threaten to overcome us, God leads us into ways of peace. When the darkness of war and the deep pit of anger reach toward us, God lifts and carries us through the darkness with hope and light. Lord of hope and life, be with us today. God, mercy and peace, lead our lives. Amen.
Let's open our hearts and minds to these words. Let us pray. Just like Peter, Lord, we, would, we want to get all legalistic about forgiveness. We want to know if one time to forgive someone is sufficient. We might even be willing to extend forgiveness twice, but we have a tendency to follow the adage, once burned, twice shy. Teach us to be humble and merciful. Remind us of the many ways in which you have offered time and time again your forgiving love to us. Heal our wounds and bind up our brokenness. For we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Elder Side of Grace. I'm going to ask the children to come forward, please. Come join me up front. Y'all can stay too. There's something special about today, besides it being Sunday. There's something special about today. You know what it is? What? Anybody got St. Patrick's Day? Yes. Today is the day we remember St. Patrick. It's also, there's a little fun fact for you that you can tell your teacher on Monday. It's also the feast day of St. Oh, I forgot. Gertrude of Nibbles. She's the patron saint of cats. And her day also follows on St. Patrick's Day. But today we're here to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. Do you know his story? Do you know why we talk about St. Patrick's or we remember him every year? Not just so we can wear green. Well, let me tell you the story real quick. St. Patrick grew up in England. He was not Irish. He grew up in England. And when he was 16 years old, he was captured by pirates. And he was taken to Ireland as a slave worked there for about six years on a farm tending their sheep and their cows and stuff before he could escape. And to escape he had to walk 200 miles across Ireland to the shore, convince a captain to give him a ride and he escaped. And he decided because God saved him that he was going to be a pastor, a priest. And so he went to school in France to become a priest. Well, after spending some time there and he, he thought, I need to go back to Ireland and teach them about Jesus and tell them about God. So he went back. After he became a priest, he went back to the same spot, to the same people that captured him and told them about Jesus. And that's why we remember, because he did, well, he did a really good job, too. The whole, uh, the whole country started to know about Jesus because of St. Patrick. And he would go from spot to spot, from town to town, and tell people. So the reason, though, that we remember St. Patrick and we think so much of him is because he forgave the people that did that to him, right? He could have been very angry. He could have been for his whole life saying, I'm not forgiving those people. They weren't nice to me. But he didn't. And sometimes that's hard, isn't it, when somebody does something wrong to us? We don't want to forgive them. We like to cross our arms and say, I'm never forgiving them. <clears throat> do you ever do that? Do you ever cross your arms and say, um, no? Okay. All right, that's fine. I must be the only one. <laughs> that's fine. But that's what St. Patrick's did. He had so much love in his heart, even for the people that treated him bad, he forgave them. And so that, that helps to remember, that, to remind us that we need to do that too. So that, that's why we wear green. That's why we wear shamrocks, is to remember St. Patrick today and what he did. And if you've got a cat, you can go home and, and think about St. Gertrude. All right, so let's go ahead and pray, shall we? And then um, after, before we pray, I'm sorry, after we pray, I'm going to invite you guys to go back into the hall because we've got special crafts for you to do if you'd like to um, that take a little bit of extra um, directions and stuff, so we'll have it out in the hall if you want to do that, okay? All right, well, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for examples, for saints that you put in our lives that teach us 
what it means to, to be like Jesus, to forgive even when it's hard to forgive. So we thank you for St. Patrick, and we thank you for all those other people in our lives who teach us and show us how to be more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You are dismissed. Like I said, you can head to the back if you want, into the hall and do an extra project. Next Sunday, I'm also going to say a few words about St. Bernadette. Everybody remember who that is? <laughs> that must be strictly a, well, this is town, this is the West End. That, that's not as a big a deal as it perhaps used to be, but that was kind of the finished parody to St. Patrick's Day. So. Let us be about our scripture reading this morning, and we'll begin in the Old Testament in Psalms. Taken from the Psalm 119, 9 through 16. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to the word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes, as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And our gospel reading this morning is taken from the book of Matthew Chapter 18, verses 15 through 22. <clears throat> if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to, to listen, Tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be granted acceptable in your sight because you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how our Bible starts, God created. Then the Bible goes on and lists how God created the specific order, the functions and forms, and then it said God created humans in God's image. We are made in God's image. Each and every single person you see is made in the image of God. And for me, I think that statement made in God's image is less about our outer wrapper, our appearance, and it's more of a claim about our minds and our souls. Our brain was made in the image of God. And if you look at the rest of nature, we humans are different. We possess a secret weapon that has allowed humankind to flourish and grow in ways that nothing else in creation has been able to accomplish. And do you know the one thing, the singular thing, that sets us humans apart from the rest of God's handiwork? It's our ability to recognize patterns. Noticing that the sun disappears every day and the moon comes up every night, so it's okay if it gets dark. It's supposed to get Noticing, hey, there is white stuff falling from the sky. 
and remembering back to the last time you saw white stuff and saying, oh, that means the temperature will drop. Better find something to help keep you warm. Noticing that this particular bush grows raspberries and they are good and safe to eat. Notice that, that the bison always migrate across this particular path and on these particular days, so it'd probably be a good idea for us to be present when they come back so we can hunt them. And to use more modern examples, have you ever stubbed your toe on furniture because your spouse moved a couch or a chair from where it was supposed to be? They upset the pattern for your house. And because the pattern was disrupted, you got hurt. Have you looked for a dish or pot in the kitchen but can't find it because it's not where it's supposed to be? I'm still getting used to our new kitchen. I haven't gotten used to the patterns of where our stuff is yet. Have you noticed that Facebook and Google and the others all seem to conveniently display ads about the things you're talking about with those around you? You've noticed that pattern, and they notice the pattern too. Our super strength as a species has always been our ability to recognize patterns. Mathematics, science, agriculture, logic, engineering, law, music, art, language, written and spoken, it's all patterns. You can't understand the word I'm saying if you don't first recognize and know the rules and patterns of the English language. That's what all rules are, is just the recognition of patterns, cause and effect. This first thing happens, and the second thing is supposed to happen too. Rules are just specialized forms of patterns. And we love rules because our minds are wired to notice, remember, and share the patterns we see. Absolutely all of human knowledge falls into this pattern. The other thing that sets us apart from all of nature is we humans are all created to have a need, a desire for something bigger than ourselves. We are all born with a God-sized hole in our heart. And sometimes we find God and fill our hearts with the love of Christ and we find a peace that surpasses all understanding. And then other times we keep trying to fill our hearts with everything else of the world, and it never satisfies. All those things we try and fill our hearts with are never quite right because only God can fill that empty space inside of us. But patterns is really what we want to talk about today. Because that's where our Bible passage is all about. The reading in Matthew is two separate, super short stories about patterns. The first section is what to do when someone has broken the rules of society, the accepted patterns of society, and then Jesus specifies the rules, the patterns of what to do when that happens. Jesus gives a step-by-step -step formula, which is a pattern, to follow so that reconciliation and healing can happen between aggrieved parties. If someone's relationship isn't right with another, then do these things. Can you see it? It's all rules and patterns, right? The second part of the reading, though, is where we encounter Peter this week. And if you remember, all through Lent, we're really looking at Peter, because in Peter we can see ourselves. We see our rashness, our insecurities, our need to be loved, our need for forgiveness, and today our need for patterns, order, and predictability. Peter says to Jesus, well, how many times should I forgive someone? Which, to phrase it another way, is, Hey, Jesus, what are the rules I should follow when someone wrongs me? Peter, like us, is seeking to better understand his world and his relationship with others by understanding holy patterns that he needs to see in his life. He wants a measurable set of actions that can repair a broken relationship. You ever felt like that? That life would just make much more sense if God told you exactly what you're supposed to do? Life would be better if you knew what God expected of you and specifically what you're supposed to do in your life. From vocation to relation to especially piety. God, should we pray 10 times a day or 11? And how long exactly, in seconds please, should the prayer be? 
But what about reading the Bible? Yes, I know we're called to read the Bible, Lord, but exactly how much should I read? One chapter a day? One book? 18 verses, unless it's Proverbs, but only nine? What are the rules for being a Christian? As a follower of Jesus and a child of God, what am I supposed to do each and every day, Lord, so that I can be in your good graces and do exactly what you want me to do? When I was in college, I really struggled with and thought about service, Christian service. How much service am I called to do? Because I can always do more. I can always do more. I can sleep less. I can shift things around and do more service. So what's enough, Lord? And it wasn't about minimums. It wasn't about what's the least amount I need to do and still keep God happy. It was about finding the life, the right life balance. If I serve this much, Lord, something else has to give in my life. There are only so many hours in the day, and Lord, I'm glad to give up studying for my exams if that's what you really want me to do. So tell me, Lord, because I'm willing to serve, but speak plainly. What do you want me to do today? Give me the checklist, and I'm on it. I think part of that was the Midwestern guilt we've all perfected. Always feeling like we don't do enough or plain aren't enough, but I earnestly and truly wanted to know what did God want and expect from me. Have you ever felt that way too? Peter in this passage is like us. I don't think he's looking for minimums to get away with anything. I think Peter is earnestly desiring to do what the Lord expects of him and to make sure he's doing enough. Peter asks, how many times should I forgive when someone wrongs me? And Jesus says, well, Peter, you are to forgive those who wrong you 77 times. Now all the analytical people in the room are saying, okay, 77, that's fine. How do I keep track of them all? Is there an app or something I'm supposed to download? Because at 78, I get to let them have it. I can't remember if I've mentioned before, but numbers in the Bible are always more complicated and more complex than they seem on the surface. Just like for us in our culture, the number 13 is an unlucky number, and 7 is a lucky number, in Jewish culture, especially in the Bible, the numbers you encounter are less about mathematical count and more about the meaning underneath. And 7 and 70 both have specific meanings in Jewish numerology. The number seven refers to and symbolizes completeness and perfection. The number 70 symbolizes infinity or boundlessness. So just like we know when we watch a movie and the main character gets off the elevator on the 13th floor, something unlucky or bad is going to happen. A Jewish listener of Jesus would know that 77 means continuous, without limit. In other words, Jesus isn't giving Peter a predictable pattern that we can necessarily cross off like a shopping list. Jesus is saying never, ever stop forgiving someone, period. I wish we had Peter's response to Jesus. Did Peter just shrug his shoulders and say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Or did Peter sit with his mouth agape, mouth agape and his mind wrestling with what Jesus said. Because if it were me, I'd be looking for more clarification. Wait, 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 wait. What do you mean, Jesus? You want me to do what? If it's infinite and boundless, how will I ever know when I'm done, Jesus? I'm still looking for those patterns. I'm still looking for the rules. That's not what Jesus ever does in his ministry and his teaching, is it? Instead of giving us the rule book for life, Jesus challenges and expands and stretches our human need for absolutes and patterns. He pushes us again and again to go deeper, beyond rules and patterns. He pushes us to holiness. He pushes us to grow deeper in love. In Matthew 22, when asked what was the greatest commandment, the greatest rule of all the rules, Jesus said to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is emphasizing relationship over doctrine. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, You've heard it said that you shall not commit a murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with your neighbor, you are liable to judgment. Later on in the same chapter, he says, You've heard it said, Thou shall not commit adultery. But if you look at someone with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery. Anytime you hear Jesus begin a phrase, You've heard it said, He's about to challenge a long-held, everyone-knows-it biblical rule. And he's going to stretch it out, flip it around, so that the pattern and the rule that everybody knows is no longer cut and dry. We know what murder is. We know what adultery is. But what does it mean to murder someone in our heart or have an affair in our heart? Jesus challenges us to think different to not only control our actions, but to wrestle with our thoughts and spirits. Jesus said, you have heard, there's that phrase, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which comes from one of the rules of Jewish law written down in Leviticus 24. It's a rule to establish appropriate, measured punishments for wrongdoings. And then, as you'd expect, Jesus stretches it all out. He said, instead of focusing on the rule, go beyond the rule and turn the other cheek. Respond with peace. Jesus' teachings are less right thinking and correct living and more about daily growth and love. It's about cultivating a deeper connection with the divine. It's about birthing peace and being humble out in a world that's so worried about being right and keeping score. Jesus is less about identifying patterns, less about rules, and more about relationship and commitment to growth. In Jesus, habits are fine, rules are good, but only so much as they draw you deeper into the mystery of God's presence. And we're right back to that hole in our heart, aren't we? Our human condition is always wrestling with our need for predictable patterns and routines in conjunction with encountering God's ever-expanding, unquantifiable presence in our lives. So I can't leave you with a rule this morning. I can't leave you with a single action item so that you can cross it off and move on with your day feeling a sense of completion. I can only encourage you to focus less on the absolute certainty of patterns and rules and instead seek and dwell in the divine mystery of God's presence. Amen. Many joys and concerns this morning, and as we've been acknowledging each week, uh, this list grows, and that's a wonderful thing as we acknowledge those who have need in a variety of ways and and pray as a congregation and then as individuals through the week to support those people and ask that God is with them in whatever they require. And so we'll begin this morning with a concern. This is from uh, Susan Hill for Todd Nickens. Todd is having heart surgery tomorrow at the Cleveland Clinic. Please pray for a smooth and successful surgery. And of course, we would do that Lord, in your mercy. This does not have uh, an author, but the concern is for Luke DeLongchamp, and he's recovering from uh, shoulder surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Continuing for those that, that have these health concern needs, Lindy 
Vance, Bill, and Stacy, and that God continues to touch them that they may be healed. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And here's a, another concern without an author. Um, and we pray for it. so many, and uh, we all know what we don't, may not have written on these cards, but we carry with us each day our friends, neighbors, and families, those who are going through difficult trials. That God may comfort them and let them know that he is with them indeed. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. And here is one from Alex. And this is a, a joy this morning. And this is a wonderful thing. It's very brief, but I think we will gather the, the gist of, of these three words. Seven months sober. God is good. Amen. Here's one from Alex uh, for Kelsey Grigg uh, and uh, sick with influenza. Not a good thing there. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Dorothy Kuhn asks our prayers for Jason Peterson uh, having surgery for the brain tumor, and that's today. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Dorothy Kuhn also asks an ongoing prayer, and it's one that's always near and dear to my heart for Anne Marie, and then Brian, Bruce, and Tracy, uh, healing from ongoing health issues. And now we pray that these may finally be brought to conclusion. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And Dorothy also prays for uh, Chris uh, Culleton. Continued healing uh, from brain tumor surgery. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Cookie asks a prayer uh, for Trevor for healing and Ashley for healing and, and, a, and a cure and a release from anxiety. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Amen. Prayer. And Chad Hensela prays for, asked us to pray for Stephanie this morning. Uh, that she'll have safe travels back from uh, Green Bay and from a special weekend with uh, her girlfriends. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Nicole still asks that we pray for Brad, and I think many of us know that uh, he had surgery this week, and uh, uh, surgery went as planned and continued prayers for healing and, and pain relief. So this is a real important one that we do hope will lasting, very positive effects. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Judy Smith asked for prayers for Scott uh, Quayle uh, and Linda. Comfort, healing. Uh, Scott to, to fight RSV and to get improved uh, kidney function. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. I didn't have time to write my prayer of concern down this morning, but I'm certainly carrying it in my head, uh, and I want to share it with you. And this is a celebration and a great joy this morning. You've heard me ask for the prayers of our congregation for some time, for my good and very young friend, Eric, who has suffered from for years with terrible uh, anxiety and depression. And I was with his parents this weekend, and in a very short period of time, and I think some of you would remember me speaking about this, Eric has been in a special therapy program in a state out west, and has now come out of that program and, and moved to uh, Bend, Oregon, where he continues therapy and training, and has managed to graduate from, from high school and, and get a, a degree a little bit later in life, and, and has been able to turn a corner on depression and anxiety, and is entering in now to a, a junior college uh, program. And we were celebrating and celebrating and thanking God through the weekend. So God is good. <laughs> Amen. Heavenly God, what an opportunity and privilege it is to bring prayers to you. You've heard the prayers of the people, the 
cries for healing, the cries for wholeness, the cries for reconciliation, the, and the celebration that milestones have been reached and new, um, new spaces have been, and challenges have been overcome. We're just grateful, Lord. We're grateful for your healing touch. We're grateful for your providence and presence. We're grateful for those that stand with us when we are struggling with health challenges or life challenges or whatever. Um, those that, that provide care in our, our hospitals and um, those that provide care in our homes. Just thankful, Lord, that you've modeled for us what it means to care for each other and, and hold each other in prayer. So help us to do that fiercely, Lord. Help us to do that um, recklessly. Help us to always turn to you in prayer first, middle, and end. Because that's where true healing happens, is in your presence. And that's where true healing happens, is when we're, we reach out to Christ. And so we thank you for your son, and we thank you for the prayer that he taught us as we all pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for being a praying church. Uh, at this time, I invite you to come forward if you're able to uh, bring your ties on. so many ways, big and small. And so we are, with open hearts and grateful hearts, we give these gifts back to you that they might be used to promote justice and peace and love and mercy in our town and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Something I forgot today. God is good.
receive this blessing. May the tension between divine mystery and guidance of biblical rules be a source of contemplation and humility for us. May we marvel at the depth of God's forgiveness which surpasses our comprehension. Let us be moved to be more like Christ in mercy to others in our own lives. May God bless us as we wrestle with our human need for patterns and our divine need for our, his presence in our heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a good night.